I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Abington School Committee on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, here at the Middle High School Library. If we could all please stand for the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before, before we start the hearing of the visitors, I know there's going to be people here to talk about school safety, and I know the police chief is here tonight. I'm going to ask you, though, to direct comments to me and not directly to the police chief. Um, if at any point we want to ask him a question, it's fine, but ask to direct it through me, and then we'll go to the police chief if we need it. Okay? So with that, if anybody would like to speak during the hearing of visitors, um, please raise your hand, and you'll have to state your name and address at the podium. Go ahead. My name is Caitlin Carroll. I live on 9 Orchard Lane. Um, so I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work in the pediatric field. And I just want to go over a few statistics. Um, firearms are now the leading cause of death for American children and teens at a rate of 5.6 per 100,000 children. This is the highest by far among our peer countries. For example, Canada is the next highest at only 0 0.8 per 100,000. It's now been 24 years since Columbine. Since then, there have been 377 school shootings. Just last year, there was 177 incidents of gunfire in our schools, resulting in seven deaths. We don't want Abington to be a part of these tragic statistics. We don't want our children included in these numbers. Regardless of political views on gun control, we cannot sit and wait for policies to change in Washington. We need to protect our community's children. I am here as a parent of three young children, asking the school committee to make full-time SRO coverage at each school a reality and a priority. Our community is fortunate to have two school resource officers, but we have three schools, and our SROs are not always at the schools. They can be pulled by the APD, and they're not replaced during vacation, sick days, trainings, etc. After the Nashville shooting, I was super distraught like most parents. Um, I was able to speak to Peter, and, he, and I was really encouraged after our conversation to know that the topic of safety in schools is not being forgotten. The schools do such a great job with Alice drills. They do bi-weekly meetings to discuss students who might be struggling. There are rules in place to keep the doors locked. There are cameras in the schools that the Abington police can view. All of these tools are in place if, God forbid, a shooting ever happened. But I think our priority and focus needs to change on deterring, sorry, deterring a shooter from ever attempting. A SRO at each school doesn't only represent protection by an armed, ready to immediately respond officer, but even more so as a deterrence from an event ever being attempted. We know that the latest school shooting in Nashville, the shooter conducted a surveillance of the building before carrying out the massacre. We know, and we know there was no police officer present at the school. Obviously, we can't make assumptions, but it would be interesting to see what would have happened if a police car was out front and an armed police officer was inside. We know that budget and competing priorities are a major concern. However, I feel like we can work together creatively to make this happen. Our kids and our teachers deserve to feel safe at school. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Go ahead, Melanie. Melanie, just state your name and address. Hi, I'm Melanie Whitney, 70 Logan Mary Drive. Um, there's been a lot of chatter about school safety, and I think um, a lot of people have different, differing views on various aspects. And I heard a couple questions that came to me on my thoughts, um, and I just wanted to pass them along to the committee and to the extent applicable to our police chief to just get their thoughts. The first question, um, and I can just leave this up here in case anyone wants to refer to my questions if that's easier. Um, how do we as a school and a police department think about and address cultural or personal experience spectrums with our uniformed officers? What I'm getting at there is someone who may have trauma in their past, how they would feel about a uniform officer, and how do our SROs interact with students with a history of trauma or may have negative history with law enforcement? That's question one. Question two is, can you briefly explain ongoing trainings for SROs? Um, I don't know the answers to any of these questions, and I think the community is curious, so although 
Me personally, I don't have these questions. I think it's worth it for us to address to the community so that it's very clear as to these two topics. That's all. I'll leave it up here in case anyone wants it. Chief, would you mind? Would you mind helping us address some of those questions? Um, just Police Chief David Del Papa, Abington Police Department. Good evening. So, in respect to your first question, um, I've spoken with the SROs, and uh, both have indicated to me that they have not had any experiences so far with any students that have had um, cultural or uh, negative personal experience with law enforcement. Um, as far as how they would address those um, scenarios if they did arise, um, the answer is through training. Um, it all starts at the ground level with treating with everybody with dignity and respect, and then uh, training to deal with those uh, new and arising situations. Uh, as far as the training for the SROs, I just put together a little uh, description of the training that they've undergone and uh, will be undergoing. Um, all our SROs undergo a 40-hour certification through the National School Resource Officers course. After that, they receive a 16-hour in-service training uh, each year, the curriculum set by the MPTC. Uh, in addition to that, they attend an annual school safety conference, which is for juvenile officers and school resource officers. This year's conference will touch on such topics as supporting students during reentry from long-term medical absence, comfort dogs in schools, rescue task force, youth police academies, sexual assault investigations, recognizing exploited children, social media investigations. In addition to that, both of our uh, school resource offices have specialized training in adolescent mental health training. Uh, one is a ALICE instructor that's alert, lockdown, conform, counter, and evacuate training instructor. The other one is scheduled to go. Uh, one of the SROs is a RAD and a RAD kids instructor as well. Uh, in addition to that, all of our offices undergo training, in-service training, have gone or undergoing it now in trauma-informed policing. That helps our offices identify and explain the various forms of trauma as well as their wider impacts and how to integrate trauma-informed approaches into our policing practices. Uh, officers response to interpersonal violence. The officers learned the best practices of trauma-informed investigations of sexual assaults, human trafficking, domestic violence, and missing children. Uh, training in responding to emergencies of those with mental health uh, and mental illness issues. Uh, they learned the proper communication techniques and ways to diffuse and de-escalate emergencies involving mental health crises. Uh, cultural competency training, it's understanding the many cultural differences among people and how, to, how those differences uh, potentially affect behaviors and attitudes. Implicit bias training, uh, mental health first aid training. We're currently working on certifying all our offices in CIT training, which is a 40-hour course. In addition to all those regular specialized training, we just conducted active shooter training um, in the fall, and we're going to be conducting ASHER training, which is the new form of training. It's active shooter hostile event response. That's uh, basically active shooter training in conjunction with the fire department. So not only are you uh, addressing the threat, but you're helping triage and uh, deal with those individuals that may be suffering from gunshot wounds or injuries as the result of that event. Um, we've also made many equipment upgrades to quickly and effectively address any sort of hostile uh, situation we encounter at the schools. Uh, for obvious re reasons, I can't get into discussing what those, but uh, uh, I'm confident in saying that we're one of the best equipped departments around to address those concerns. Uh, I believe that answers both. You're welcome. Sir? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Sure, go ahead. Just please state your name and uh, address. Hello, my name is Lindsay Young, and I live at 47 Mulberry Drive. I am here to, today to read you an online petition we have created. 
The petition states, I am an Abington Mass resident and I support a full-time police officer dedicated to each Abington school building, three total during school hours. For context, Abington currently has two school resource officers that float between buildings but can get called away for patrol calls and are not backfilled during vacations, training, etc. Our kids deserve to feel safe at school. This is one tangible step we can take as a town to ensure that there is equitable on-site security coverage between buildings. Please sign your name as an Abington resident to bring much needed attention to this critical cause. Thank you. In just one week's time, this petition has been ele electronically signed by 163 parents, teachers, and students within the district. Please listen, listen to what your parents are asking for and work with the police, town manager, powers that be, in order to make this a reality. We already know how impeccable the training is for the officers for these types of horrific situations, but our goal here is to avoid having to use it. Our goal here is to deter and prevent any type of tragedy here in our small town. Between budget dollars, available grants, and provide funding, we can make this happen if it is made a priority. Our kids deserve this. Our kids deserve to feel safe at school. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and address. My name is Allison Limbaugh. I live at 438 Randolph Street. Excuse my parents, I just got back from a game. <laughs> I'm a senior here at Abington High School, and I'm here tonight to provide some student perspective on the topic of safety. I believe that we as students, parents, and administrators would all feel safer and more secure with a full-time officer at all times at all buildings. Although we can never be 100% safe, a school resource officer would provide peace of mind for students that if something were to happen, we'd at least have an armed trained police presence immediately available. As previously mentioned, gun violence is killing our kids, and though I'm not someone who's big on guns, I'd rather have a trusted and trained officer than an intruder or, God forbid, a student. As much as we trust our administrators, they're not fully trained to handle a dangerous emergency situation, and statistically speaking, these events are usually over in five minutes or less. So the chances of contacting and receiving emergency services is not good. Unfortunately, our current situation regarding school resource officers leaves us vulnerable. And with our current officers being pulled away for other schools or to cover non-related events or lack of coverage, we're, I would say, defenseless. I'm here representing the kids that you as the school committee and administrators have been hired or elected to protect. And especially at this day and age, we are connected we are concerned, sorry, for our safety and feel as though there are ways we could further be protected. Please listen to our concerns and work to make this coverage a reality because we deserve to feel safe. We want to live on to go to college and grow up and protect our families. So please work with town officials, the police department, and come to a mutually beneficial solution, whether it be budgeting, grants, there has to be some way to make it happen. Everyone loves to think that it couldn't happen here, but it could be anywhere. I'm sure they said the same things in Uvalde and Newton Nashville, and we don't want to be the next statistic. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Hey everybody. <clears throat> I'm Shauna Torpy, 30 Pine Tree Lane, Abington. Uh, many of you know me. I am a resident. Um, I'm also a mom of four. And some of you may remember I spoke um, last year at the school committee meeting uh, last June, voicing my concerns about school safety in light of the Uvalde tragedy. I just couldn't get the image of blood-stained green converse out of my head. Um, and we're here almost a year later, and I still can't get that image out of my head. And there's been X amount more school shootings since then. Um, I think you've heard from kind of a lot of us already tonight, but I just want to say um, <clears throat> since then we have, since that last um, school committee meeting that I was attending last June, we have worked to form a district-wide parent safety group that meets with Superintendent Schaefer as well as Dr. Michelle regularly. The group's mission is to work alongside the administration to ensure the District of Abington students and staff are protected to the best of our ability while attending school. Our goals center around improve, improving coverage, personnel coverage, mainly SRO coverage, 
uh, building infrastructure and equipment, policies and training, and screening at-risk kids, which we're doing a wonderful job at. While we've made progress at the margins this year, including organizing a safety inspection between the administration and the Abington Police and Fire Departments, and exploring ways to enhance our entryways at Beaverbrook and Woodsdale Elementary Schools, we seem to be hitting constant roadblocks stemming mainly from budgetary concerns to make meaningful progress. I'm here tonight to make the school committee and the members of the public aware that this group exists and we're here to hopefully help enlist all of your help for change. In my opinion, nothing is more important than the safety of our children. It is one thing to say this, as I think all of us in this room will agree to that. It's quite another to act on it by devoting tangible budgetary dollars to make this a reality. Please give this topic the attention it deserves and support our group with our improvement efforts. I am first and foremost here to ask the school committee to work with us to increase our SRO coverage to one full-time officer at each school building. I was told by one administrator that she sees police coverage more, more on a weekly basis or an as-needed basis than on a daily basis. Well, I hope to God that the shooter doesn't decide to act during, say, 85, 90% of the time that they're not there, when every literal second matters. An unnamed teacher was quoted saying, I rarely see officers at school due to their busy schedules. In all honesty, I know that if something were to ever happen at my school, I just have to deal with it on my own. This is our current reality, but I, leave, I believe we as a town can do better than this. Let's start by making full-time officer coverage at each building a top priority. I urge the school committee and administration to help us make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Go ahead. Hi, Lisa Brown, 64 Nash Memorial Road. Um, I didn't actually plan to speak tonight, but this is just such a emotional and distressing topic for everyone. Um, I really appreciate everyone who's gotten up to speak about it um, already. I think it's also just important to, to think about and focus on all the different things within our control for student safety. And also, you know, that includes physical safety and psychological safety. And, um, you know, I don't have any comments tonight about the, the SRO discussion. I appreciate everyone's viewpoint, and I'm still kind of learning about all the different pieces of that. But I just would love to also hear a discussion about what we're doing, continue to do for mental health in our schools with the students and also supports for families in our community. Um, because it, you know, certainly, at, you know, somewhere at the root cause of some of these issues um, are mental health issues. So I just would love to continue to hear a discussion. I know we talked about um, the new Carousellos program a couple of months ago, I think, but, um, you know, would love to just continue to hear that as part of this conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? And I'm going to close the hearing of visitors this time. Before I do, um, I just want to say, I think I, I don't want to speak for everybody here, but student safety is an absolute top priority for everybody, everywhere, I would hope. Um, in terms of how that gets accomplished, I think we're always continuing to look at any and all best practices, partnering with the Adams Police Department. We have a wonderful relationship and partnership there. Um, I know we can continue to do that. Exact things that can happen, those are discussions that have to occur. Um, I don't know if, um, do you want to add anything? Wendy, do you want to say I just, I, I, I actually just answer. have a question for the chief. Can you tell me from the police department how long it takes to get to Beaverbrook, the high school in Woodsdale? Do you know, like you guys must have timed that, right? Less than a minute. Uh, I think that's pretty good. I mean, and I'm not trying to take anything away. I definitely know safety is a priority. Um, however, I think that our kids are pretty safe in these buildings. I know that uh, the district has done a lot to ensure that that happens. And for being for a small town and being a minute away to Woodsdale is pretty exceptional. And 
looking at, um, I can't even tell you which one it was, but there was an SRO officer at a school that had a shooting, and that SRO officer was there and didn't do anything about it. So I think it depends on the person, the SRO, like not really, you know, you, we could have a, an SRO in every building, but that doesn't mean that they're actually going to act if there's something going on, you know? So just a different way of looking at it, that we could have a body there and we could spend 80,000, 120,000, whatever it is, but that doesn't mean that they're actually going to do something. It's, you know, hopefully they do, but I'm just saying like, there's another part of it that, you know, hopefully everybody has the guts to, or the SROs to actually move in and do something. So I don't know, that's it. Chief, can I ask you just one quick follow-up? Because there, obviously there was plenty of discussion about an SRO in every building. And I don't know, um, I don't know outside of Abington. I don't know if through your peers, um, if there's been any discussions about what other town setups are like in this. Um, I guess I'm looking in the South Shore, right? I'm not looking to go all over the country. But around, this, around the other South Shore, um, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing that the budgetary constraints may be there throughout other towns as well. I don't know if you can share any light, shed any light on what other towns SRO status are. And um, okay, okay. Yeah, can I just ask, though, the Cable, are you able to pick up any of this information? Because this is obviously a very important topic mm -hmm. to everybody in the room, but then everybody in the community. So, okay. Did any, did any of that really great answer by the chief make the, you're the best. <laughs> Abington student. The intention will they, they will go back to the original assignments, which is Monday through Friday assigned to the school because of the because of the staffing shortages we had, we, we had no other choice. We had to utilize. Yeah. That, ultimately, that is the goal. And so, when based on your projections, when I'm hoping within the next year, I'm hopeful, but I don't want to promise anything. Right. I can't deliver. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So if I could just for a moment, um, Dr. Michelle has a presentation about safety and about 20 different things that we do that's going to completely miss the mark for this group because none of those things include adding a school resource officer to what we already have. Um, and I don't think anybody would, would disagree that statistically speaking, you'd be better off with an armed, trained uh, officer at each building and if that were something that Abington could do, I don't think anybody, I don't know if, you, know, you may get some objections in the community, but I don't think there would be many. I, I think we'd accept that um, with a lot of, you know, a lot of gratefulness that we've got that uh, with, in our system. Um, to date, the resources haven't been there to provide that coverage. I'm gonna tell you, after the years of, of doing the job that I've been doing, um, the most important thing is to have a productive, collaborative relationship with your police department. I've never worked with better leadership. I've never worked with better school resource officers than the individuals that we are currently working with. If I had my choice between having a resource officer at every building or having a very, very thorough, thoughtful, productive, open, honest relationship between the two departments, if I could have one or the other, I'd love to have both. 
If I could have one or the other, I'd have what we have with the leadership in the police department and with the SROs that we have because we dive down into issues until we pull every string that we can find until there are no more strings to pull uh, as things begin to unravel. That does not mean that we are safe. There is no way for me to say in this society with the violence that we have that we are, I feel like we're totally safe. That's not going to happen. And you're going to see this presentation and you're going, oh, it's great. They do all these things. Why? Well, I didn't know we did that. It's great too. But I, I can't tell you we're going to be 100% safe. But that's, I think, that philosophy is what keeps us the safest that we can be because it's an ongoing effort to continue to dive down, to dive down because we do these drills and, and I'm telling you, a, 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 your, the hair on your body stands up as you do these drills because you take them seriously. There's a sense of purpose here, protecting the people that, that uh, come to these buildings every single day. The kiddos, you drive away and you pray and you hope that the people in charge put their lives before all else. The staff do that. Um, that doesn't mean we're 100% safe. Um, and it, and, and so nobody's going to disagree that having a, a, an additional resource officer wouldn't, wouldn't be a good thing. It, it just to date, it hasn't been available with our, with our current resources in this town. And, and to be honest, we're, you know, I feel fortunate that we have what we have. Never going to be enough. Um, always going to want to do more, but it hasn't been available with the current resources. Um, you brought, someone brought up the good point about mental health. You see in our budget that we've added adjustment counselors. Um, that's a part of this. Uh, taking care of the needs of our population so that we don't have kids that feel isolated, feel alone, feel disenfranchised, want to hurt themselves and hurt other people. Um, we're, we're trying to do that work, and we can't do enough work in that area either. The, the Care Solace program, uh, the, the, they gave those cards to the chief. Uh, he's been, thought, he's been uh, uh, kind enough that the officers in the Avenue Police Department are going to carry those cards in their cruisers, and if the family's in crisis, he's going to pass those out. Um, I just, we've got we to get a hold of them for the fire department and, and the Learn to Cope group, um, because it also in, includes um, uh, help with addiction. Um, so I'm, I don't want to stake too much from the end of tonight with Felicia's presentation, and I'm, I'm sorry, Felicia, I let the air out of your presentation already. It's a wonderful presentation, but it doesn't talk about adding an SRO. And, um, um, but uh, I, just needed to, I just needed to say those things. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who came, um, expressed their thoughts. We appreciate it. Chief, thank you so much of for coming ahead of time. I, my only ask is um, if it's possible, the SRO training that you read earlier, is it possible to share with the superintendent who can maybe distribute it out Absolutely. The to the parents, to the yeah. council contact? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, guys, I'm just going to skip uh, around for one second. I'm going to jump to the award, okay? Yeah. Um, so we're going to move on to the presentation of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Certificate of Academic Excellence. I'm going to turn it over to you, sure. Mr. Schaefer. So, and I'm going to ask Christina to, Christina to help me. Um, we have the, the award is from the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents and it's a Certificate of Academic Excellence. And um, our, our winner is, I'll leave it up to you. So our winner is Ryan Libby. Um, I just wrote a few things about Ryan because I've been his guidance counselor for the past four years. Um, from the start, he has been a mature, hardworking, independent, and humble young man. Academically, he stands apart from his peers. He has been enrolled in the most rigorous and demanding course law that Abington High School has to offer has performed exceptionally well across all subjects. It's extremely rare for me to see perfect scores of 100 on a student's transcript, but that is what you will see when you look at Ryan's records. This is most impressive given Ryan, <coughs> excuse me, involvement in extracurricular activities. He has been a four-year, two-season athlete in the sports of basketball and lacrosse, which he is currently the captain of. He is a member of the student council and has been working a part-time job since 2019. Ryan's hard work and dedication to his STEM classes in particular has earned him numerous awards, including the Rensselaer Medal, which recognizes students who have um, distinguished themselves in math and science. 
Ryan plans to pursue a career in mechanical engineering at UMass Amherst, which you just told me about, so that's really exciting. Um, and I cannot think of a more perfect fit for him. It is an honor uh, to present the Mass Certificate of Academic Excellence to the valedictorian of the class of 2023, Ryan Lilly. Peter, just get a picture. Yeah. Right, I'm going to make you take a picture. Can you have your parents come in? Well, you want, I'll take it so you can be in it. I, I can take it and then just. <laughs> You don't have to. <laughs> Congratulations, Ryan. Congratulations, Ryan. We're very, very excited for your success at UMass. I'm going to send it to Heidi. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to jump back to the reading and approval of the minutes. Um, so the first one we have up is March 28th, which was our last regular um, meeting. There's only, and I, I don't even, it's not really part of the thing. Wendy was, Wendy couldn't be there. So Wendy wasn't present at that meeting. Um, oh, did I miss it? So I think looking through the rest, I'm good to make a motion amended to have Wendy as not marked as absent from that meeting. Sorry. I can second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, and then next up, we're going to do them separately, are our two executive sessions for um, discussion of the new parameters of a superintendent contract. The first one is February 28th. Uh, we're going to do them, so we'll do them separately. So if anyone make a motion to approve the February 28th executive session. I'll make a motion. We'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then March 22nd, which was done virtually, is the last one. I can make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you guys very much. Um, jumping up, report of the director of curriculum instruction. I think Ms. Park, you're just going to go, or is, Chris, is Dr. Bostic going to? Okay. You guys can figure that out. <laughs> okay, hello again. I'm Christina Park, director of guidance. Um, a lot of this information is a repeat of last year, but I just wanted to give a refresher on the department. Counselor breakdown, so we have three guidance counselors at the high school. We um, split students up by their last name. So Sarah McGinnis has students A through F. I have students G through M. And Jessica Tasha has students N through Z. <clears throat> and we discuss uh, social emotional needs, academic counseling, course selection, post-secondary planning, and new student registrations. And students have the same counselor all four years. Um, every year we do group lessons with our classes. So for grade nine, we do an orientation to high school, which goes over the graduation requirements, GPA, academic eligibility, attendance policy, and clubs and activities. Grade 10 is an introduction to our Naviance program, which is a college and career readiness program. Grade 11 is post-secondary planning. Um, we do the um, overview of the post-secondary planning process and use more Naviance college application features. And then we continue with that in grade 12, and we help students create a common app, the application process, and again, more Naviance with those students. Um, guidance events, we hold a lot of events throughout the year. Um, I'm not going to list them all, but you can see them here. Um, a few highlights that we have coming up is um, Senior Decision Day, which is next Monday. So seniors are encouraged to wear their, their decision on Monday. Come down to guidance, we'll have some little raffles and some pictures, um, so it should be a good time. And then we also have a field trip coming up to a construction site, so any student that is interested in getting into construction, we could take uh, about 10 students. Um, it is held at Mass Massasoit, um, that's in a couple weeks, so we're going to be advertising for students to um, sign up for that. 
new this year um, for college information sessions during bridge block we've never invited colleges to come to speak to our students and we decided that that was something that was important um, so we had four colleges come um, and speak during bridge block and it was bridgewater state UMass Dartmouth, Bryant, and UMass Boston. Hopefully next year we'll secure more colleges um, to come and speak to our students just to talk about their um, application process because every college has different requirements. So it's nice to hear from a range of schools. Um, we also developed the monthly guidance newsletter, which hopefully some of you have seen, um, just showcasing all of the events that um, guidance has to offer. And we put up a TV screen in the guidance department, which also um, shows all the events so that the students are more aware um, of what's going on. Um, we partnered with CARESOLS with the help of the adjustment counselors, administration, the school psychologist, um, to just help our students and families get more access to mental health support. And we developed the Mass Hire Partnership, um, which is a really great um, opportunity for our students that allows um, just those career-based field trips. We did a STEM career field trip to Bridgewater State um, back in March. We just did a career day conference. Um, and again, we have that construction day coming up. So um, just exposing our students to more careers um, and getting them you know, more thinking about what they want to do after high school. Strengths, um, we have an experienced staff. Um, all of us have been doing it for more than uh, 10 plus years. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we have an ongoing commitment to social and emotional well-being and the academic success of all students. Um, we collaborate amongst all stakeholders and we are very strong with technology and communication. Um, these are the areas of growth that I presented last year. So um, we wanted to increase student knowledge on the variety of post-secondary options available to them and I feel like the Mass um, Higher Partnership has is the start of exposing students to, to different types of careers and educational opportunities. Um, we have increased the information sessions during bridge block um, by adding those colleges to come in, but we also increased our group sessions with our juniors um, to, from one session to two sessions. We do one with the juniors in January and in June. Um, continue to provide resources uh, to students through multiple modalities because we found that a lot of students don't technically read their emails all the time so we wanted to make sure that um, we were giving them all the information in so many different ways so um, with the monthly newsletter the tv screen and guidance we have the canvas page we've been doing the assemblies um, we did a scholarship assembly a couple weeks ago and we've had i think we made a record in terms of students actually passing in the town scholarship application which um, we had student 80 students pass in this year which is great um, and then again to continue education on local mental health resources available to our students again we partnered with carousellas and then um, dr robbins helped secure a pd from john crocker who is the director of the massachusetts school mental health consortium which was really helpful for our staff Things that we hope to look forward to in the coming year, um, again, I think it's just always going to be our goal to increase our student knowledge on post-secondary options available to them. Um, and again, to be continued to be educated on local mental health resources um, for our students. And then the last bullet is something new that I want to work on is to promote summer enrichment options for students. Um, there's a lot of colleges that offer things over the summer that um, we will email out to our students, but I feel like, again, they don't check their email. So if we can just consolidate um, all that information for our students so that they can do some things over the summer um, that could hopefully bump their resume up, um, I think that would be a great thing. So, Vision of the graduate. Um, I feel like our department focuses on all domains, but I just pulled out these two just because I feel like it's something that we work on daily with our conversations with our students. Um, just to give an example, um, successfully navigate social situations. Um, we're, we're involved in facilitating um, mediations between students so we can help them navigate you know, difficult conversations with their peers. <laughs> and then using technology to enhance learning. The Navance program is a great tool in terms of you know, finding self-discovery um, self tools. We just did a career interest inventory with our um, sophomores. So they were able to answer a bunch of different questions. It produced a list of careers for them. Um, and then they were able to kind of connect careers to different majors, different schools. Um, so it was really um, cool for them to use. 
um, prioritizing and managing time effectively. Um, we always meet with students about this, especially for students who have had long extended absences, creating a plan for them um, when they return to school, how to manage their schoolwork, um, how to have those conversations with teachers, um, just time management in general. Um, and then taking intellectual risks. A lot of these conversations happen over course selection. So when we're meeting with students, you know, looking at their grades, maybe recommending they bump up a higher course if, if they're feeling like they're, they're ready, looking at their teacher's course recommendations. Um, so that is something that we have conversations about on a daily basis. Went through that very fast. So does anybody have any questions? Sure. Any questions? Um, just a couple. Yeah. Um, Credit for Life, is that the math department and does it still happen? It is um, the health department, Miss Daisy is the one that runs it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure sh if she's doing it with a co-teacher in the math department, but yes, it is still happening. Okay. Um, so kind of credit for life for me with the financial literacy and thinking ahead for the kids. And then for me, that goes hand in hand with career fairs. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, so I was part of a career fair at the school that I teach at and students signed up for after school sessions. Mm -hmm. There are about I don't know, 25 to 30 professionals in the community that came in and ran workshops for the kids. Yeah. Um, they went and they met with all of us. We did maybe four 30 minute sessions. Kids signed up for the careers they were interested in, came in, talked to us. Mm -hmm. um, do we do something like that? We don't, but I'm hoping, you know, with the Mass Hire Partnership, we That's took them for about. the career conference. We, would, we were only able to take 30 students, but unfortunately only 16 signed up. So like getting the word out there and making sure that the students are accessing the, those um, field trips that Mass Hire is offering, I think is our start. And do something. We can look into it. Okay. I know that there was a career day um, years ago pre-COVID. Guidance wasn't involved in that. I think it was more the business department, um, but it's something that we can look into. I've thought about some ideas in terms of um, having a, because we are a small department, trying to make it a little bit more manageable for us, yeah. is maybe having um, specific career-based speakers come in during bridge block and kids can sign up during that way. So for example, if there's parents in the community that are in the health field that would want to come in and discuss, you know, their um, education, their daily life activities and their job, um, stuff like that. And then maybe do a health one, a law enforcement one, a business one, an engineering one, just like the, the top um, careers that we see our students get into. Um, I think that could be a start and an easier route than organizing a career day right now, yep. just given the small department. But yeah. no, anything, that, any information that we can get to our kids. Um, yeah. Ideally, I would love to see all of the seniors do like an in, in, in school half day thing maybe mm -hmm. where they, so that we, we got all kids to do it. But I know that there are certainly obstacles. Um, and for sure, I know it was easy enough for me to be one of the people who presented because I was in the building and that's my job. <laughs> it's a lot to ask community members to give up a personal day to come in um, much easier for them to come in in the afternoons so mm -hmm. so many moving pieces but yeah. anything that we can do would be awesome mm -hmm. um, so thank you yeah. can i give a shout out for the newsletter oh thank you <laughs> it's, um, as you said the kids don't always read their emails so sometimes it's nice to read what you wrote and say hey did you see an email about this <laughs> um so if people aren't getting the emails as parents of the high, at the high school level, it might be worth checking your constant contact settings to see because um, there is a lot of good information in there, thank especially you. as your kids get older and it gets a little scarier what the next steps are going to be. So thank you for the information. I appreciate that. I want to credit Danielle Gaylor for um, designing our newsletter because she was <laughs> the one that put it together at the beginning. So thank you. Also, thank you for the junior information, college information night. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mrs. Park, can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. On the college information sessions during Bridge Block. Yes. Did, did it, did you see it as a positive for the students that you would, that's, it, it, was it worth, I guess I, I'm asking, was it worth it for the impact that it made on the students? I think so. I think it definitely, I mean, the schools that we had 
work schools that were kind of close by so they yeah. could actually go there. Yeah. My goal is to see if we can get some schools that are farther away that students may not actually be able to get to so easily okay. um, to hear um, you know, what that school has to offer. But we find a lot of times that our students don't go on as many tours as we would want them to. So to bring to the, the colleges here right, to yeah. talk to our students, I think is, is definitely helpful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just say I work for a local college, so if you want to email me, I can oh, maybe. Great. <laughs> they would love to come on. Amazing. Talk to your students. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was like a going thing. I mean, I remember I think a lot of a lot of high schools do that. So um, it's just weird to hear that we're just finally doing it. Mm -hmm. I thought that it would be something. I mean, I only have an 11th grader now anyway, and only one child, so I had no idea in the past. But um, that for something like that to continue, and get bigger, um, I would just hope that that happens. And also bringing in unions is probably, you mm -hmm. know, some kids don't go to college. Right, so. we had um, Southeastern Technical Institute come in to talk about the trades to our students, um, which was really informative. Um, at that mass hire event that we had the career day, there was um, the electrical union, which um, had some really great information. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I We have always brought our students to a college fair in the fall, um, but we've never had colleges come into the school to speak, so I, I would love to keep it up. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Park. Thank you. Chris, you want to go ahead? Um, the next up, uh, English Language uh, Learners Department update. Um, Mrs. Dupree, am I saying that right? <laughs> Dupree, okay. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Dupre and I'm the director for pre-K through 12 for the ELE department. And today I'm going to talk about the strengths of our department as well as our areas of growth. Um, so before I get into our strengths and areas of growth, I want to give you a brief overview of our L population in Abington. Um, currently Ls make up about 12% of our total student population. And as you can see from our graph over the last 10 years, our L population has been consistently and rapidly increasing. Former English learners are students who have exited the ESL program but are closely monitored by ESL teachers for four years. Um, so English learners and former English learners combined make up almost 15% of our stu total student population. Um, we also have a large group of students who are not ELLs or former English learners whose first language is not English. Um, and that makes up almost 18% of our population. Um, as far as languages, our students come from 18 different language groups. Our largest language group is Portuguese. 73% of our L's speak Portuguese as their first language. Um, we also have a growing Spanish and Haitian Creole um, speaking population. Um, and then another thing to note is over um, this past year, we've had uh, over 30% of our English learners um, be in their first year in U.S. schools. Um, last year, James presented on our areas of growth, so just an update on that. Um, in order to accommodate all of our growth, we've added staff. Um, so we've added a 1.0 ELE teacher at Beaverbrook, a 0.4 teacher at Woodsdale, a 0.6 teacher at Abington Middle School, and that's made a huge um, difference in our department. We've also purchased the REACH curriculum for Woodsdale School, so now Beaverbrook and Woodsdale have the same curriculum. So there's a continuity between grades K through four. Um, and also now that K through four has the same curriculum series, um, we are working towards writing curriculum at the elementary school grade level. And we're making sure that our curriculum is aligned with the 2020 WIDA standards, as well as vertically aligned within our department and laterally aligned within the grade level. So students are learning language skills that will help them in the classroom. Um, so some of our strengths, we have an amazing team of ELE teachers. Um, our teachers are culturally proficient and they follow an asset-based approach to language learning. Um, an asset-based approach is the idea that we build off students' strengths rather than focusing on their um, deficits. So for example, we view our students not as students who are, have um, a deficit in English, but students who are emerging bilinguals. 
and they come with um, linguistical and cultural assets that are strengths that we can build upon. Um, we also offer a lot of student programming. Um, we offer ELE tutoring, uh, the ELE summer program. Uh, last year we had about 30 students attend that program. And this year we have a language buddies club at the middle school that pairs newcomers with students who are either native speakers or have been here for many years. Um, and then at the high school, there's a Brazilian students club that just formed. Um, our department is also really focusing on family engagement. Um, this past year, our LPAC, we've been meeting about once a month, and we've had up to 40 parents attend our LPAC meetings. Um, we have, and I think here's a picture of one of our LPAC meetings here. Um, so parents are able to come to school, ask questions about um, you know, various questions, how to check student grades, questions that maybe they're not comfortable to speak in other circumstances. Um, we also offer other events to bring families into the school, such as the ESL Family Breakfast, ESL Family Night. Um, we had a coffee and literacy event. Um, we've had two technology workshops, and these workshops coincided with when grades were released at the elementary school level. Um, so we were able to show parents how to check student grades and also contact te the teachers if there was any concerns about their grades. Um, and finally, for the third year in a row, we were able to offer adult ESL classes. And our adult ESL classes were funded through the Abington Cultural Council. Um, this past year, we had 30 parents who consistently came. Um, so moving on to areas of growth, um, our, we have a huge focus on decreasing the L dropout rates at the high school level, as well as closing the achievement gap for Ls across the district. Um, some things that we're doing to help combat that are making sure that our support teams are consistently discussing students who are at high risk of dropping out. Um, some of our students who are at high risk of dropping, dropping out are students who have interrupted learning, um, students who come from backgrounds where um, their families are not financially stable, students who come to the United States on their own or with one parent. Um, we've also been working to collaborate more with other departments in order to help um, different departments support their English learners. Um, and then another um, focus that we've been working on is helping make sure that our L's are having access to the interventions available at school. Um, our second area of growth is allowing for more common planning time between ELE teachers and content area teachers. Um, one challenge has been time. Um, our ELE teachers in the past had a very full schedule and didn't have time to meet during the common planning time of other teachers. Um, but we're working this year to carve out time um, so ELE teachers can work with content area teachers to help with accommodations in the classroom and also so content area teachers can better inform our ELE teachers what they are teaching in the classroom so our ELE teachers can um, focus their attention on skills that will help them access the content in class. Um, finally, we are also working on having a complete written curriculum for K through 12. And like I said earlier, our focus is making sure that our curriculum is aligned with the WIDA 2020 standards, as well as vertically and laterally aligned. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I do. Yes. So for the you know, students maybe who have difficult backgrounds like you talked about, do you have resources or partnerships, I don't know if it's with guidance or um, community groups within the town, churches, to help connect them with other services they may need for like food insecurity or housing insecurity, you know, because obviously those play a big part in their success um, academically. So do, are those resources available to them? Um, yes, yeah, so um, we make sure that our student support teams, our SST teams, are aware if students do come from really tough backgrounds. And we try to provide um, supports that we can. Um, we lead families in the direction of where they can maybe find therapy in their native language um, and just direct them in um, where they can find other resources to help them with um, food, shelter if needed. Um, just one question. Do we um, dedicate PD time for the ELE teachers and classroom teachers to meet? Um, Do the ELE teachers get a chance to give workshops and work on strategies? So I'd love to do that more. Um, in February, um, the ELA teachers at the middle school did um, a little bit of PD during our faculty meeting um, where we reviewed a bunch of technology tools that teachers can use. Um, we have a lot of new teachers across the district and some of our new teachers weren't familiar with um, some of the tools that we had. Um, and then I 
this past um, PD, we had a speaker come to Beaverbrook, and she was out of district, but she provided um, really helpful PD for teachers on um, different tools they can use in their classroom to help support their English learners. It's just so important because a lot of the strategies that you'd use for our ELs are strategies that all classroom kids would benefit from. It's just really good teaching. Yes. Um, so I, I know that PD time is stretched thin, but it's so important to get some consistent time, not just that one day. So I, I don't know what we have for the next year or two, but I would yeah. love to see more. I completely I, agree. I pop in yes, there please. and just say that yes, <laughs> We agree, and next year, the main focus of our district-wide PD is going to be exactly what you just said, EL strategies that benefit all students. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, my turn. Um, clearly not here, um, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, but do we have access to the statistical data on um, the percentages of dropout rates on our EL students versus um, our mainstream or our, our English like our English speaking students, native English speakers. Um, and do we, I'd be curious to see what the statistics look like on how we're approaching that and maybe some of the reasons why, like what it is that we're losing these kids, what else can we find? So do we have that data right now? And if not, can we get it? Um, sure. Mm -hmm. you want it? Well, I was gonna say that I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, right. um, but all students do drop out at a significantly higher rate than um, native English speakers. And I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, that. just that the data that's available um, from DESE is a year or so old, right? So, so we're keeping so our data from DESE right now and not, do we have in-house data just out of curiosity? We do. Okay. We do. It's easier for us to access what DESE's already pulled together, and then we can compare ourselves to um, other similar districts in the state. Sure. Um, and, but even our internal data, right, is 2022. I would just, right? I would so be it's interested to coming see. off of COVID, so our our dropout rate went up for everyone, for everyone. Uh, especially for our EL students. Uh, so yes, we can we can get you that. Because part of what I am curious, thinking long term, is if we know that there is already a disparity. Um, and piggybacking on the idea of having this commitment to these strategies for our ELs as well as all learners. Um, will we be able to use this to try and minimize the gap and are we going to follow along with that data as we do this? And thank you for being able to understand what I'm very inarticulately no. trying to roll out of my mouth right you now. You did a great job. Oh. And I can add to that that our um, Student Opportunity Act funding, our SOA yes. funding, a lot of that um, is based on our English learner population numbers um, increasing. And part of our proposal from 2020, 2020 on how we were going to use that funding was exactly to address the achievement gap and the dropout rate. So that's something that we're constantly adjusting and working on and reporting back to DESE. And that report is available online as soon as DESE uploads this one this year. Clearly, whatever we can do to retain yes. our students, we want to be able to do. But at the same time, um, having been privileged enough to work with a lot of our students this year, um, and particularly one EL class in in particular that I can think of. These kids are risk takers. They are fearless. They are fabulous. And that speaks volumes not just to them and their families, but also to the professionals working with them, that they are just in it full on to learn and to just try it all. So there are things that are going really, really well. And I just love it if on the opposite end of that, we can try and bring that energy up to our oldest students as well so that lifelong learning becomes their target as well so thanks yes I love so that. um during the pandemic <clears throat> i think um it's commonly held that you know there was a disproportionate amount of uh um difficulties depending on different population groups what population group you are in so our our students who are english learners um 
you know, there was there were travel difficulties during that time. There were also uh, difficulties finding work uh, during that time during families, and so there was a there was a jump in uh, the dropout rate during COVID. We know that, um, and the reason we compare ourselves to uh, Massachusetts for that is just and I've said this before. We want to do better than everybody else, and we use that. Um, Massachusetts information just to help us benchmark because all things being equal, all communities face the same struggles as Abington did. We weren't the only ones who had to, you know, shoulder the pandemic. So you will see a jump during COVID. And as Chris said, our numbers are, are dated. We've got to, you know, we've got to continue to update them and track it. But um, those are the populations that the ESSER money and the Student Opportunity Act money are for and you know you know because you've been here through all this that's where we've been putting a lot of emphasis in terms of um the appropriate use of those dollars so i just wanted to add i more call out some things that i noticed in there and um great job by the way but like looking at looking at that graph even from the beginning we've almost, we've had almost probably more than a 500 percent increase in english language learners in less than 10 years it was 2014 to now um i think you know i think most people know we've done our best to per in our budgeting to give as much staffing as possible we have two added right here it's probably clearly not enough there can always be more i mean i think we know that but i do just want to um some of the programs i i more just want to give you kudos honestly um so the language buddies club i love that idea um i think it could be used in other areas um Dr. Robbins potentially special ed buddies club um, and the active engagement um, I've been to some CPAC meetings before so I just want to say 40 parents attending the LPAC meetings that's incredible and I know some of the nights we've left here the ESL the adult ESL classes have actually been going on I think that's an unbelievable thing you're doing for the families and I know the grant is helping provide that but I think it's unbelievable that we're trying to do the best we can for those that need it for those that need the supports the most so that was all i wanted to add thank you supporting our families are definitely supporting our students thank you very much appreciate it up next mr bykowski before the director of technology It's going to be so ironic if you want to what goes wrong. <laughs> All right, thanks, uh, thanks to the committee to uh, give me a little bit of time to talk about the Abington Public Schools Technology Department. Um, I just wanted to outline to start, uh, the Technology Department in Abington has four members, myself, uh, Oliver Critchlow, and Reese Papineau are our computer and network technicians. Their positions involve a lot of the day-to-day uh, fixing student computers and, you know, going into classrooms and sorting out projector issues, repairing screens, anything that might come up on a daily basis, uh, the things that they generally take care of. And then Vicki Graham is our technology integration specialist. Her role is to get into classrooms, to model best practices with teachers. Um, she creates a ton of documentation for our staff to review back on for any particular um, initiatives that we might be taking on, like maybe Canvas or Clever, so that people can go back and look at that documentation after the fact. You know, if she provides them a training, then they can reflect on the things that they've um, Go. For example, I think she was instrumental in those um, English learner classes in the in the evenings, teaching people how to access she uh, was. grades and things. Like Thank that. you, Peter. That's a good combination yeah, that the IT department helping the EL department I love that uh, there's some statistics I'm just throwing out um, you know there are four people that work in our department and we manage over 2,000 you know devices laptops and desktops we have projectors we basically you know the joke is we're in charge of everything that plugs in right so if it connects to the network that's something that we're responsible for so in, you know all the day-to-day -day operations you know inputting attendance into Aspen. We need to make sure that that stuff is working. The kids using their laptop devices in class, the kids using their laptops at home, like all those are things that we are responsible for supporting. 
My goal sort of in the technology department though is to just sort of make the technology get out of the way. Like in a perfect world, nobody even knows we're there because everything's working perfectly. So that's our goal. It's, it's impossible to be that way all the time. But um, if someone can come in to school, open up their computer and get to work and not have to worry about anything stopping them, then that's why we're here. Um, not only, as I mentioned, do we do that hardware, software type support, uh, having Vicki in our department is huge because she's the person who teaches everyone how to use this stuff. So it's, you know, part of that, I'm involved in that a little bit, but that is her focus. So it's not just here's the device, figure it out. You know, we have someone in our department who's also available to help them figure it out without having to do it on their own. Um, so. On a day-to-day -day basis, um, we in the department receive tickets from our customers, right? Our customers being the teachers in the district, the students in the district, and families. Anyone can open a ticket with us, and that's how we know that there's a problem. Somebody may open up a ticket because their laptop screen is broken, or someone may open up a ticket because their projector is not displaying, or the toner and a printer is out. So we get any range of things, and so that's how we, on a day-to-day -day basis, figure out the things that we need to do to support folks in the district. So just a couple of statistics. Last school year, we closed 4,157 tickets over the course of the school uh, year from August 15th until the end. And then this year, the estimate from the numbers that we have so far is we'll get to 3,941. That's a little bit of a decrease, which is great. Makes, it means our job is so much easier. But uh, reasons that that might happen, because that's usually not the trend. In the time that I've been at Abington, the trend has been the amount of tickets have gone up and up as we've added more technology. But uh, two of the things that I wanted to point out was uh, the help from the staff in the library. Uh, Trisha London, Sheila Manzi, and this year Caroline Ellis has been doing her student teaching in the library and helping as well. If you're not aware, when a student has an issue with their device in the high school or the middle school, if they can't resolve it in the classroom with the teacher, they bring the device to the library. And in the library, they do an initial triage of what the problem might be. And uh, sometimes they help them, and the student can go right back to class. And if they can't help them, what they do is provide them with a loaner, and then that device comes to our department so we can resolve the problem. I looked this morning around 9 o'clock, and the library staff had seen, uh, had had 1,042 specific events of a kid coming in looking for help. So that's between, you know, that's from the start of the year until this morning at nine. So it could be an issue simply that they need to restart the computer and the librarians may help them with that. It could be an issue where they lost a file and they may sort that out. And so some of those issues don't make it all the way to us and that's a huge help obviously. Without them, um, I don't think you know, we'd have far more tickets and I'm not sure we'd be able to provide the support around the district that we're able to. The other thing that we added this school year that's new is uh, if a student does damage their device, whether it's an accident or maybe it's not so much of an accident, we do uh, send a letter home to parents now to let them know what we found in the past. We've had a one-to-one. -one, kids have been receiving computers for, I think, it's six or seven years now. So we're adjusting things as we go. And what we started to see last year a little bit more than we liked was sort of a repeat customer issue where someone might have a broken screen and then a month later they're coming back with a whole bunch of missing keys and so we thought it would be best to maybe involve the families as well just to let them know what is happening in the past we'd fix the issue and the kid would get the computer back and and, and who knows what would happen between them so we've added that I don't have any statistics that say that that's helped but it is a difference between last year and this year so it may have had an impact on maybe some of that repeat customer business that we were having before Okay, a few projects that we have uh, worked on this past year um, through funding, well, this is an ongoing one, but through funding that's been approved at town meeting for the past couple of years, we receive money to purchase new laptop devices for our fifth graders and our ninth graders. So all of our fifth graders to ninth graders get a computer that they can take home with a bag and with earbuds. And so now with that funding, it becomes a sustainable situation you don't have a computer for eight years you have it for four years which is a reasonable amount of time i think for our students so when the kids come to fifth grade the first day of school those devices are waiting in their uh, classroom for them 
Uh, the kids keep them for the four years. They take them home for the summer. Um, they take them home every night. And then when they get to ninth grade, uh, I've been working with the administration in the high school, and this year what we did was the day after Labor Day, the freshmen got their computer. Because they, they will have had their computer from eighth grade over the summer coming into ninth grade. And so they received theirs very quickly at the beginning of the year, but it's easier than the first day because they have to give the other one back. Um, we are working on replacing staff laptops. We aren't doing that uh, in mass like we do with the students, but with some school funding, we're, uh, we're dealing with that. This year, we opened up the Aspen Parent Portal. Um, in the past, families would have to log in to Aspen as their students to find their student information, which they could do when the information is there. But if you happen to have six children, that's sort of inconvenient because you'd have to log in and then log out and log in and log out, right? So now families can log in with one account and see all their students in one place, uh, K through 12, which is obviously a much easier user experience. And one thing that I'm excited about for this summer is uh, an update to our emergency calling system. I'm sure everyone's familiar with hearing Peter say there's a snow day. No snow days this year. But um, that system has got a major update, and some of the benefits of that are the ability to use that same system to send phone calls, emails, and text messages. So I know that a lot of people prefer text messages. Maybe you don't want to get woken up by Peter at 5 in the morning. I don't know why you wouldn't. But now there will be other options. And um, there's translation built into those things. So you know we can reach the folks who may not understand what Peter's saying because English is not their first language using that you know one single system so other things that the IT department is responsible for uh, cybersecurity not everyone's favorite topic but um, the district applied for a cybersecurity grant with the state and that grant we, we were awarded that grant amongst other school districts and towns in Massachusetts and that grant provides our staff with online training on cybersecurity. So they can learn about recognizing phishing attempts. They can understand why you shouldn't let people come in the building behind you, um, things like that. So we can get a better um, baseline cybersecurity posture for everybody. Uh, it's important that everybody can recognize those things. There are other school districts around us that have had issues with being hacked. And it often comes in through an email that seems innocuous and has some sort of link on it that um, someone might click on. So the more training we can do with that, the better. Uh, the technology department is responsible for making sure all devices are patched and that we have the most security that we possibly can. This past year, we implemented a new um, web filtering system. It's called LineWise. It's on most of our computers, all of our student computers, and then other computers that are shared. And what that does is it filters the internet as we're supposed to for the federal government, but it also provides an extra layer of protection in the sense of that it blocks computers from getting to malicious websites that maybe they mistakenly might get to otherwise. Uh, we are moving all of our devices into Microsoft's uh, Azure Cloud. We use Microsoft devices here in Abington, and that cloud gives the IT department better visibility into the devices no matter where they are. I wish this had been done before COVID because obviously everyone was just at home at that point. But now, you know, knock on wood, that never happens again. But this does give us the ability to know, oh, there's a computer that's at someone's house that has an infection, and we can kind of remediate that before it gets back to school, which is a huge help. And this year, we added a process of uh, physically removing backups from the school. We have a number of backups. We have backups in the cloud. We have backups in the server room here in the building. But we also now take our backups off-site. So in the event that something catastrophic, like a fire in the server room, again, hopefully never something like that would happen. But if it did, our critical systems are backed up off-site, and we can recover from something like that if it did happen. Physical security, which has been a kind of a theme tonight. So we've worked, we work with the maintenance department a lot on this and with town funding that we received uh, in 2021. That's when we extended our camera and electronic locking systems outside of this building to the other two buildings, the elementary schools. So we added a number of cameras at both Beaverbrook and Wisdale. We add electronic locks. Those locks the electronic locks give you opportunities to know who's coming and going, and you don't have to give out keys 
if a key gets lost and you have to rekey like an entire building, right? Well, with a fob, you can turn those on and off as, as people come and go, or if someone loses it, it's much easier to manage than um, a, a key and handing out keys to everyone. And this past year, this year, excuse me, um, we applied for another grant with the state um, in order to add additional cameras to both of those schools. So we, I think we did a good job with the monies that we had of coverage, but you can always add more. So we applied to see if we can get some more money to add additional camps. <coughs> and the reason that we all come to school, curriculum, instruction, and special education, we work with those departments as well. Um, there's a couple of examples here. We worked with Dr. Robbins, worked with Dr. Basta. You know, we, it's not necessarily our, our day to day responsibility, but um, one of the things that I do think is important is that we can use technology to make sure that education is accessible for all of our students, you know, whatever their supports might be, whether it's, um, you know, needing something, needing their device to read aloud or having their device in a different language, you know, technology can help bridge that gap. Um, and so we want to be a part of that. And I think, um, you know, we work with those other departments to make sure that that's the thing we, we look out and, you know, we try and find new products that may be helpful, you know, for the special ed department and you know we can run it by them we're not the subject matter experts necessarily although vicky is a teacher so she does have that experience but you know our technology side of things i think meshes well with the other departments in the district so that we can help build that technology competency and make sure that our students are supported in that way and that is my last slide thanks Rich. Yeah, just, just to give you an example of something I've seen over the last couple of years. I think it was years ago, Vicki was showing a kindergarten teacher um, how to make a mouse move through a maze. And the students manipulated the mouse by pressing certain buttons to make the mouse go right or left or get to a, you know, a goal of a piece of cheese or something. And um, that is the precursor for computer programming. Those are the fundamental skills that a computer programmer uses. and. I was in a kindergarten classroom a couple weeks ago, and there were students working in a group programming this little plastic toy mouse to go through a maze. Um, and that's, you know, again, um, it's amazing to see kindergartners that it's, that it, that it's um, become that a part of the fabric, a part of the life, a part of the daily activities of children in the public schools. You say, take out the laptops and get onto this website, and it's a, you know, third grade Roman and they're up and they're on the website in less than a minute. Whereas five, six years ago, that would have, all chaos would have broken out. There'd be one person running around the room saying, okay, enter here, no, enter there. And so it's really impressive to see the, the whole technology operation. Um, <laughs> quick question. Um, when teachers or admin are having a technology crisis, there's no one more important in the district than you and your team. Um, are you all housed in the same building? And if you are, who do we have at each school? We, our office is in this building. Um, it's in the back of the building, it's sort of hidden. We don't necessarily <laughs> re uh, reveal our location, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, we're at this building, but Abington's pretty small. So, you know, we can obviously, we're not as fast as the police, but we can get to, uh, we can get to where we need to be fairly quickly. Like if I'm having a crisis in my classroom and I really, really, really need to do my lesson, and I need you, I, is there, I would say is there there's, you somewhere it's else. Very rare that you don't get the help that you. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate that you guys are um, now giving laptops, um, you know, in the elementary school and then tra when they transition to the high school, um, because that's huge. Um, that didn't happen before. So I guess I yeah. didn't mention either, you know, something else that. Because once we get computers back from seniors and, and from eighth graders, coming ninth graders, we can filter those down to the elementary schools as well. So at Woodsdale, every classroom has a computer for a kid. Like it, there's a card of 30 in there. So there's actually enough for the kid plus extras. So all the way from really third grade up to 12, if the kids have a device that's sort of assigned to that. They just don't go home. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, you had said that um, you like a flag would come up basically um if a student was at home you know using the azure for microsoft yeah that's that's mostly based on um if they had some sort of malicious software on their computer 
um, we would we can we can tell that before maybe they bring it into school and affect some of it. So um, can you tell like what websites they're using and everything too, or just? We can tell what websites they're using with the other product that I mentioned, like LineWise product that does the web filtering. We can tell what websites they're using there because we have to block certain categories per the right. government, like uh, pornography, for example. So that system does track what they're doing. And do you guys keep like a data list of what kids are? Uh, there's a list in that system. I don't review it. Um, it is. It has been provided to the middle school and high school office. So in the event that they have an issue, they could go in and review it. It's not something that's regularly, but it is definitely stored. Uh, okay. The students' web behavior. Awesome. Thank you. And um, do you have a, a written information security plan? We do not. Okay. It needs to. That needs to be created, but it is not. Okay. Um, so is is it? Are you supposed to have one though? There's no rule that okay. says you need to have one. There's a number of them we should have. We should have an incident um, response. Like if, they, if something went crazy, we should have an information security one based on maybe privacy. So there's a number of policies that we should have, but there's no requirement that anyone in the school has one. It would just be something that would be beneficial for us. So it's something that I have in my head, but it's I'm often just trying to find time to do it. Right. And if you do do it, um, I would just recommend like all the teachers and staff getting a copy and signing off on it that they've read it. Um, and if you need any help with that, I can send you some info. Okay. Thank you. Rich, I just want like you mentioned it too, but I just want to reiterate um, regarding the town the town meeting and the funding. Like, thank you to the town because obviously without technology isn't going anywhere, right? It's not going to get less technologically advanced as we move along so we do need to replace these laptops and the money that they provide us in the budget helps us to continue to do that um you mentioned the eep and the work being done in there i just want like i went about a month ago i was in one of the special ed classrooms there and it was incredible the um the use they were able to get out of using the touch screen for some of the kids that are nonverbal, um and being able to work with them i just i hadn't seen it in action before so it was great to see and um now i know how it was um being put about so thanks and there's a big shout out to Vicki on that one too. She spent Thank you, a lot Vicky. of time in those classrooms. And I remember the first day she came back to the office and said, I went into the room and they were doing it. I think she was actually so dancing. Right now. That's, 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 <laughs> No, I just want to say thank you. You guys have been awesome over the years. And any time that I've had an issue or know anyone that experienced one, um, you guys are right on it. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, thank Vicky. Thank you, everyone. Up next is the Woodsdale School Improvement Plan. Ms. Baresi. left so hopefully yeah hopefully this out. <laughs> Vicky said Good evening. I'm Jen Baresi, the proud principal of the Woodsdale School, and I'm excited to be here tonight to share Woodsdale's school improvement plan. I was trying to think of a little clever way to connect with you to begin, and I was thinking of a funny anecdote because something hilarious happens every day at Woodsdale. And I was, I did come up with something. Um, yesterday, Stephen um, is a little third grader at Woodsdale, and on my first day there, he um, approached me at arrival like he was the mayor reached out his hand and said, hi, my name is Stephen, Miss Baresi, Stephen with a PH. So I like immediately knew him. And so yesterday, Stephen with a PH missed the bus. And so we were 
in the main office hanging out together waiting for his mom to come and pick him up and so I was just you know chatting with him getting the lowdown on his little sister and we were just you know having a little conversation and so the main office is usually bustling at dismissal and then you know Steven's mom was about 20 minutes out so after about 10 minutes in um, the main office is getting quieter and quieter and quieter so he looks at me and he says so Miss B what do you what do you do when all the kids leave and I said, well, I work. And he said, oh. And so then he, and he waited, and you could see the, like, a little, like, thought flicker across his face. And he said, oh, so, you, so that's what you do when all the kids leave? You just, you work? And I said, yes. And he said, ah, well, no, duh. You're the <laughs> principal. Of course you work. And I said, yes, exactly. <laughs> and so I'm thinking as the principal of Woodsdale, I am so incredibly blessed to be in this community of learners surrounded by sweet, um, sweet, smart kids and families. And my staff is just outstanding. They stretch and push themselves each and every day to um, reach all the needs of all the kids. Um, and I would be remiss without you know, acknowledging them tonight. And I also wanted to thank the brains behind the School Improvement Plan, which is my incredible School Improvement Council, um, Chris Coyle, um, Shauna Torpy and Vicki Graham, our parent representatives, and then our teacher representatives, Megan Eddy and Andrea Doyen. And so um, to get started this evening, I wanted to go over um, some highlights of some wins that we've experienced through this year's school improvement plan. So um, all of our goals from this year's plan and in next year's plan, the underpinnings are to ensure that our kids at Woodsdale are happy, safe, and learning. And so when we're looking at goal number one, which is grounded in teaching and learning, um, one of the highlights this year is that we successfully implemented Reading Workshop as our tier one core curriculum focus for ELA. Staff received um, consistent, in-depth monthly training and coaching sessions from Jen Yeager, who's our consultant from the Teaching and Learning Alliance. Um, you would be amazed at what our kids are doing each and every day as they are reading and responding to complex texts. It's like Harvard. And then uh, Chris today, you know, Nora was part of um, some historical book clubs in her third grade four classroom and they were examining elements of setting and how that sets the stage for a deeper book discussion. And then um, Rowan, Joanna in grade three was doing some research on sharks so the kids are just really doing some um, amazing in-depth work as a result of reading workshop, and I'm really proud of them. Um, within our second goal, with um, increasing community connections, it was super important this year as in my first year as principal to make sure that I was connecting with our community at large. So we've had some really great events at Woodsdale, including open house, parent conferences, curriculum night and our um, grade three team host hosted a, an MCAS information night. So those were some great opportunities to connect with students and their families. And then, um, oops, so sorry, our third goal with providing a healthy and safe learning environment. Um, social emotional learning is at the heart of everything that we do at Woodsteel. So we've expanded our offerings to include uh, monthly school meetings with individual grade levels and kids are um, exposed to daily morning meetings in their classrooms and they have access to weekly snack groups and lunch lunch. So moving into this year's school improvement plan. Again, our three goals are connected to the um, district district strategic plan and they're grounded in teaching and learning, safety, and social emotional learning. Some highlights of some of the activities that we're gonna be doing next, doing next year um, within each of our goals. Goal number one next year within teaching and learning. Um, since this year's focus was um, reading workshop, we wanna make sure that next year we're moving into um, the science of reading and we wanna make sure that we're giving students an opportunity to um, strengthen their decoding skills. So we're going to do a deep dive into phonics and spelling 
and um, I'm, we just uh, wrapped up a um, phonics committee group led by Dr. Vasja. I'm pretty certain that we're going to be moving into um, adopting foundations. Um, so that will give teachers an opportunity to um, teach critical foundational skills to um, help kids lift the print during reading. I think just like we did this year, it's going to be real important next year for teachers to have um, explicit training and coaching to make sure that they're um, understanding how to teach these foundational reading skills to kids. Um, a highlight for our um, second school improvement goal with keeping um, our kids safe. We're partnering, we're partnering with our district-wide safety team, of which um, Shauna was talking about earlier. And um, one of the ways that we're ensuring that Woodsdale is a safe place to learn is by experimenting with some volunteer greeters who are present at the front entrance of the building, and their role is to help reduce the number of people who are in the building and to ensure that all visitors check in at the main office. And then um, within goal number three, this is my favorite, to ensure that um, you know kids are happy at Wood Steel. We have um, a huge core value program happening that extends the work that Mr. Haas started last year. But um, in order to, to promote a positive culture and climate at Woodsdale School, we have the OWL Awards. So we host um, monthly grade level meetings um, to identify and embody the core traits of an outstanding OWL. Since we're at the Woodsdale School, the OWL is our little mascot. So, um, for example, this month we st are studying cooperation. So we launch at the beginning of the month our core value focus in a team meeting. We might watch video, we might read a story, but we discuss what the trait is and what it looks like in practice. And then um, when kids go back to their classrooms, the teachers are on the lookout for ways that the children can demonstrate these traits on a daily basis. And when the students are using the traits, so exa for example, if a student is um, using cooperation, the teacher will acknowledge the student and then the student will come down um, to the office in the morning after morning announcements and they get an owl sticker. It is my favorite time of day. The line is out the door and around the corner with kids coming down earning. Um, when they receive five stickers, they um, are in the nest. So we have a gigantic bulletin board in the um, cafeteria for all to see. And then they get an owl. The owl goes in the nest. They get a certificate. They go on the Facebook page. So they're acknowledged on social media. Then they keep earning. And then um, once they earn, so it goes in like increments of five. So once they earn 10 stickers, then they go, then they become an outstanding owl. They fly out of the nest into the outstanding owl tree. And then they start to earn prizes for every five stickers that they earn. And then the student with the most stickers at the end of the year will be the outstanding owl for grade three and grade four. And then we'll have a little acknowledgement for them at our last um, all school meeting in June. So those are just some highlights of each of our goals and some of the activities and um, indicators of accomplishment that we're going to put into practice next year. Does anybody have any questions? Jen, I have one. Sure. Um, first, of, well, I guess first of all, though, um, I'm going to offend some people probably with this one a little bit, but I love Woodsdale School. <laughs> Um, this is my fourth year there. It'll be my last year having a student there. Mm -hmm. But um, I love going into that school. So I just want to end exactly what you said about the teachers. I 100% agree with. Um, so the kids in there right now, they were really impacted their whole Beaverbrook career, let's call it that, by COVID. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing as you work? What, what is your staff seeing as it works with them? Where do you think they were hit the most? I guess, and maybe it's the work on the, the phonics and the spelling and, thing and the reading, and that's where it needs to focus on. But is that where you're seeing where that grade level, that group of kids were impacted the most by COVID? Because they pretty much, I know fourth graders, it happened in first. Yeah. Second was co was a cohort year. Mm -hmm. The third graders, it happened in kindergarten. First was a cohort year. Second started off weird. So they kind of lost most of their Beaverbrook careers where it started. So I guess, what, do you, what 
um, what difficulties did maybe in a normal situation wouldn't have occurred that you're seeing now in addressing them? Um, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think it's a, a little bit of everything. I mean, I think, I do think academically, yes, I think that phonics is an area of need and that's why we're addressing it. Um, I also think um, social emotional learning is a need. I don't think that that was because of COVID. I think COVID sh like sh shined a, shone a spotlight on what had already been existing. But I do, I, I definitely think social emotional learning is a, a, a huge area of need that we're seeing. Um, and that's why we're trying to get an 8.5 school adjustment yes, counselor yeah. um, and just making sure that we're well staffed and that we have um, things in place to, to help kids and their families. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, my question piggybacks on that. Um, I think across the board, I, I've been um, keep checking in on behavior. And um, I'm just wondering what the informal chatter is. Um, I know it's been not the best over the past couple of years. And I'm just wondering, are we seeing it get a little better, a little worse at Woodsdale? And um, are we offering the teachers enough support for any behavior issues in the classroom? Can you tell me a little bit more, Danielle? Can you give me an example so that I can best answer you? Yeah, I guess just um, when we talk about the um, the emotional, the social emotional learning, um, the the personal accountability piece yep. of students behaving appropriately in the classroom, and if they're not and they're disrupting the learning of all the other students. Um, are we seeing that get a little bit less? Are the incidents, I, I know it was in the initial year or two back that the chatter, the informal chatter was that overall yeah. in classrooms everywhere, yeah. it was a big issue. Um, and I'm just wondering, are, are you hearing that at the Woodsdale? It is, are there any behavior, overall big behavior issues or does it seem to be overall under control? And if there are, kids that are having those um, moments where they m may need to take a quick time out so that yep. everybody can move on. Um, are the teachers getting the support that they need? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you, that makes, I just needed like a little yep. bit of context. So I think, I think that you're always going to see kids have I needs. Say, sorry, are there consequences? It's hard at that level, but the consequences for student behavior, different from a middle and high school perspective, but, um, who handles that and and does everybody feel supported? I figured it was you. Um, I just wanted yeah. to check in on that. Yeah, um, I think you know. I think that you, we're always going to you're always going to see you know, we're in a public schoolhouse, right? So we're always going to see kids um, have struggles. I think it's important to have a core value program, for lack of a better word, or like a study at the core, so that we're giving kids tools so that they can be a really good citizen and they can be their best selves. Um, I do have a positive approach to disciplining kids. It's very problem-solving oriented. Um, and I think at Woodsdale we do work as a team so the teachers aren't feeling alone and they feel like that they have a team of supports to help them. So we work closely myself with the school um, psychologist, with our school behaviorist. Um, you know, we, we work as one and so we're constantly meeting as a team on a weekly basis, connecting with teachers all the time to help them problem solve. Um, so I, w I would want the teachers to feel like they're not alone and to feel like they have um, you know, a big team to help them. So I, would, I hope that they feel um, supported. And students, I mean, I try, I try to, if there are consequences, um, I make sure that they are natural in that they mirror, you know, where like the event happens. So if something happens, you know, at lunch, they might have a little reflection, a little reflection lunch with me. Or if something happens at recess, maybe they miss five minutes of recess and we reflect. But the we always come back to like, how can you be your best self? How can you learn from this mistake? Because kids are going to make mistakes, and we want them to own what they do and to to learn from it. Uh, ask it through me. Okay. So I'm wondering if as part of support for teachers, 
kids who can get there and you have professionals available uh, to support a student that, for example, a student that they can assist with people in the middle to provide the extra support that you can do when the student can help. So basically consistent powers like this. so it's a something somebody that the student may recognize throughout the day kind of thing like a norm like a different than an I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let you answer in a second. I'm going to guess that it might be, I don't know if we have powers. Aside from, I mean, there are children that have one-to-one -one powers that are assigned for um, certain instances like that. But Ms. Barassi, you can answer, or Peter, even throughout the district. I don't know if there's specific powers that would be designated just for situations like that, right? No, not, not to handle discipline or um, uh, behavioral management. Um, I'll let you talk about how you create a team with the, professionals we've got a lot of support in classrooms but you can always have more but you want to explain how that team works when a student has a meltdown yep if a student has if this if a, there is a student in need the teacher will um, call the office and then myself the behaviorist or the school psychologist will um, help to support the student so if I'm not available, you know, it's almost like we're, we're one person. So if I'm not available, the school psychologist will jump in. Or if she's not available, I'll jump in. Or if the behaviorist is not, it would still, you know, so we all just, um, we all work together. Sure. Thank you. Anything else or anything? Go ahead. I didn't mean. I don't know. All right. Uh, two points. Um, three, really. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, well, late. <laughs> um, <laughs> So number two, goal one, number two, um, the phonics in the spelling program. Thank you for, for seeing the need for understanding um, very direct, explicit instruction, particularly in the area of phonics and reading. It's so very necessary if we are going to create lifelong readers, learners. Um, you can hear about a reading and throw out the best theories out there but it's not going to help you if you cannot read the job application you're trying to fill out and so it sounds interesting to people to hear all right we're bringing phonics into third and fourth grade it's always good to have and build and rebuild and hone those foundations so i'm super glad to see that this is coming back um, and I'm very excited to hear what the teachers have to say as a result of having um, something that I think a lot of them have been looking forward to having back in rotation. So that's something I'm excited about. Um, as far as the um, safety uh, improvement number two, um, and this goes back to the first discussion we had and I think to the discussion we're going to have on safety, and this is essentially to everyone in the room um number one the first word written there is is partner and i remember a time in a space and a place where one of the schools their response to kind of what was happening in the world around us was basically to say we don't want any volunteers in our school thanks for coming mm -hmm. and as a parent that just about crushed me because that partnership was what I needed. Um, it's what I wanted. It's what I craved. I was, you know, and it, there were, it, it was the most isolating feeling. Um, and to the group that sits here right now, one of the things I admire is there is a concern and a group came together and had ideas had thoughts, had discussions, and I'm using that in the past tense, and I know it's not a past tense thing. So it's always important to have these discussions ongoing, but to know that the school 
and this committee and the parents are coming together to discuss things. And even as it's being discussed in the community, that is a sign of kind of a healthier community in my view, because when we're talking about it, we're acknowledging it, we're coming up with more creative ways because we don't want to ever be complacent and be, be not in my backyard people. So the fact that you are talking about allowing volunteers to kind of have a say and to think a little bit more about how we can do this creatively. You know, we are here to keep our kids safe. We're here to help our children learn. And to me, this is a fabulous goal and I'm glad it's there. And thank you to everyone who is working calmly, creatively, and kindly together to kind of affect some change. That's that. Thank you, Adam. Ms. Nassie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Dr. Michella, Assistant Superintendent of Schools on a School Safety Update. Thank you. Yep. I believe on the counter uh, next to the camera is a copy of um, not the PowerPoint, but the items in the PowerPoint. If people are interested, um, you can have one of those. Um, otherwise, I'm going to talk through some of the uh, safety and security um, items, uh, experiences that we have, I, things that we do. We've talked a lot um, already tonight um, around our SROs and the role of our SROs and the training that goes into our SROs. Um, I, I think as has been said already, but it's important to reiterate that we are always looking for ways to improve the safety in our schools. Our schools aren't safe enough. Uh, and, and having that um, idea that our schools aren't safe enough is what is gonna keep us um, striving to have our schools safer. So. Um, we are always looking for ways to improve. We are always looking for ways uh, to increase our security. However, tonight I would like to provide you with um, a number of items that we are doing today in our schools um, and that are ongoing. So, thank you, Dr. Basta. Um, the first one uh, we've talked about already is that uh, the Abington Police Department um, has assigned two police officers to the role of SRO. Um, as the chief indicated earlier, um, he plans to have additional uh, officers undergo that same training to become SROs. And, uh, and he also spoke about the ongoing training um, that the SROs um, engage in both in um, school uh, SRO training and school policing and mental health and trauma. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in collaboration with the police department uh, and our SROs, we conduct uh, training, um, safety training and drills throughout the school year. Um, you probably, uh, I hope, had heard that the Friday before April vacation, all of our schools participated in uh, some type of ALICE or evacuation drill. And uh, depending on the school uh, was different scenarios that uh, were practiced on that Friday. I also think that it is really important to talk about after each of those events, the time that we spend debriefing the time that we spend administrators with uh, staff, um, administrators in the police department, those of us that were observing, uh, to, to talk about what we could do differently and what we should do differently. And, um, and that absolutely happened on that Friday afternoon and actually will continue tomorrow. Uh, we have an administrative team meeting and that's one of the agenda items on there. Are there, um, you know, every time you do a drill, you learn something. So, um, that's been um, very um, positive and it's very helpful. Every single staff member in the Abington Public Schools, whether you are a permanent employee, you're a substitute teacher, um, you undergo ALICE, you, you watch an ALICE video, an ALICE training video, so everyone speaks the same language, everyone understands what ALICE is, and um, so we are thankful that every single employee as part of their onboarding is to, uh, to, to take part in ALICE uh, online training. There's also um, training that is put on through ALICE, the company, um, that's uh, online training that uh, staff participate in yearly as well. Um, 
uh, Rich talked about our camera system. We have uh, cameras both interior and exterior in all of our buildings. I'd like to thank Town Meeting, um, as uh, was talked about earlier, for funding addition, uh, funding cameras at Woodsdale and Beaverbrook and also key fob entrance at Beaverbrook and Woodsdale. All of those cameras can be viewed uh, in, that, in the school specific and also at the police department. In the dispatch area at the police department streams all of our um, exterior, cam exterior and interior cameras into uh, the dispatch area. So if something were to happen, that can be another um, uh, po point in which they can see what's happening in all of our buildings. The school department, um, unfortunately, as you know, uh, you've probably, I'm sure, seen the emails that we've had numerous threats to student and school safety over the last couple of years. I think we can say we've seen an increase in that. And through our collaboration with the police department and our school resource officers, we have a very established protocol on what happens should our school, should we hear about a threat either to um, our school or students or faculty within our school and that protocol is followed every single time and you have seen emails that say this morning we found out and you're not getting the email till five o'clock and that's because it took all day for both the school it may have taken if you got the email at five o'clock it's because it took the whole day for the school and the police department to um, go through that protocol so that's something that um, to say we're proud of seems a little not the right word but we are proud of where of the protocol that we've established with the police department and are very thankful for our relationship with the um, sros and the Atlanta police department for that uh, rich talked about faculty and staff are provided with limited access key fobs so um, you have a key fob that gets you into the building to which you're assigned um, not necessarily all the buildings, and it's also uh, timed. So you, um, different people have different access. Um, if you're a staff member, then you have Monday through Friday access. You wouldn't have Saturday and Sunday access. So uh, that's also helpful um, that we, and, and it's recorded. We know who's coming in the building and at what time, who's leaving at what time, if we needed to, to find out that information. Um, and if a faculty or staff member leaves, then their fob, if they don't turn, uh, turn their fob in, which they're supposed to, it can get shut off, uh, which is also helpful. Um, throughout every day, our, we've asked um, our staff to be, faculty and staff to be aware of checking doors as they go by them, and also have asked the, our custodians to deliberately check doors multiple times during the day. Um, I also know it's even hard for me going into a building not holding the door open for the person walking behind me. Um, it's really important that if you're at a building and you're buzzed in to, what's it called, um, uh, tailgating, to not ta let someone tailgate in with you. It feels awkward, um, but it's important. We have signage. Um, I was just at the Woodsdale School today, and they have nice signage on the front door that if only those people who have identified themselves to the office should be coming in the door. Sorry, I'm really sorry you have to wait, but um, until you are, you identify yourself so they know that you're waiting, that they're waiting for you to come into the office also. So um, we ask visitors to please come in one at a time. And again, I know it's awkward to tell someone who's standing beside you, um, sorry, you have to budget, you have to ask for permission yourself. Uh, recently, the school department, this is also been mentioned, was awarded a $50,000 grant with Safer Schools and Communities Local Equipment and Technology Grant. Um, that's going to be used to increase uh, camera coverage at the Woodsdale and the uh, Beaverbrook and also to, um, to add key fog entrance. In the last month or so, the Abington Fire Department has provided voluntary stop the bleed training for our faculty and staff in each building. So faculty and staff were invited after school, um, again, voluntary, to participate in a Stop the Bleed, which is um, the use of a um, tourniquet. And um, after they completed the training, that they were provided with a tourniquet and with um, blood clotting gauze. Uh, and that's something that they can then have in their classroom. Additionally, 
in all of our AEDs or automated defibrillators, which are um, uh, placed uh, in each of our buildings, uh, there's also a tourniquet kit within, um, within those uh, cabinets. So in each cabinet is a defibrillator and also a stop the bleed kit. So um, we're, we're thankful to the fire department uh, for providing that training and anticipate that that'll be something that will be um, offered again. It won't be a one time um, in, in the fall, we'll have that training as, uh, as well. We've talked a bit about um, mental health and our mental health supports within the Edmonton Public Schools. Each of our schools has a student support team. Some of them are called different things, uh, but uh, in a student support team consists of administrators, counselors, school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, school resource officers, and nurses. And SSTs um, meet regularly uh, throughout the school year uh, to discuss um, academic and social emotional health of uh, particular students and also um, you know it's a, a, a brain uh, trust to talk about the best way to support students and families and who's going to reach out to the family what types of supports can we provide individual families um, again um, both academic and social emotional um, uh, resources uh, we also um, have had a priority around student um, uh, mental health in our schools and with that we've included school adjustment uh, increase in school adjustment counselors in our budget we made it a budget priority and the, um, the school committee supported our budget priority of getting the school adjustment counselors that were included in the federal ESSER grant into our operational budget so that's something that even after the federal grant uh, runs out next year that'll be something that'll be part of our ongoing operational budget is to have those uh, school adjustment counselors uh, included um, in our schools and we have um, had great success with our school adjustment counselors um, I guess great success is you know that's also a weird thing to say our students um, have been have uh, accessed their services um, and we're we're thankful for that um, students in our elementary and middle school our, uh, elementary and middle school we have, are taught uh, the second step curriculum that helps students uh, build social emotional skills um, and uh, that help them thrive in school and in life and so we're thankful that we are also um, providing everyday skills for our students signs of suicide which is an evidence-based curriculum is taught to all high school students so students um, at Abington High School have tool, uh, the, a toolkit to recognize signs of suicide um, in school and also um, instruct talked to and instructed with who to speak to about that you know, trusted adults within the school um, and lastly um, in the fall we um, we partnered with um, Be Smart, which was a campaign uh, to promote responsible gun ownership, uh, to reduce gun deaths, and we disseminated information to the Abington community around the Be Smart um, responsible gun ownership program. So, last slide is to reiterate um, that the safety and security of our students and staff is our most important uh, priority um, we can never make our schools safe enough uh, but we can continue to uh, grow and reflect and um, provide training um, and reflect on those trainings uh, so we are um, we continue to be better and lastly I'd like to again thank the Abington Police Department and the Abington Fire Department for our partnership and it really is a partnership and we're very lucky to be in a community that the schools um, respect the police and the police respect the roles of the um, police department um, I can tell you just as a you know I talked about um, post Alice drills on Friday in the discussions that we had and um, they were there with our SROs um, the perspective of the police department and the perspective of the school department and um, we had a long discussion in the hallway at the Woodsdale School, and it was great. You know, things that the police department SROs hadn't thought about when they're thinking about um, school safety necessarily because they're not educators, and things that I hadn't thought about um, 
a different set of eyes from someone who's a police officer. I'm not a police officer. So um, I'm very thankful for the, co uh, for the conversation and the communication and the, um, and the trust that we have with each other. Can I ask uh, the committee and the chair? The, I, the question is, um, Felicia, thank you for running through that list. But as I mentioned earlier, it's absent what I think a lot of people you know, want to talk about adding school resource officer. Is it worth asking our chief, who's been kind enough to be here with us tonight and, and stick through this till 9 o'clock with us, to describe again the possibilities for improved coverage with the existing staffing? Is it worth? Sure, would you mind just a note, just in case it didn't get picked up to the first time? Thank you, I appreciate it. You know how when your kids are in dance programs, they schedule your kid to perform at the first part of it and the end of it, so you have to stick through everything? And I just want to say too, I want to, Dr. Michelle, thank you for the update. Um, I know I received, I received a bunch of emails right, about, a, about a month ago asking for um, school safety to be part of the agenda, so we wanted to provide that. We want to provide the opportunity for everybody, for, for parents to come and talk earlier tonight um, and have open dialogue about it. Not everything can be solved right now, but I hope we've been able to give you at least that opportunity to have the discussion tonight and continue it in the, into the future anyway. So, God, Chief, thank you so much. So, uh, a couple of those items that I spoke about earlier is uh, as we onboard more uh, officers out of the police academy and improve our ranks. Our goal ultimately is to get the school resource officers back into the schools full time and not have to pull them away on shift coverage to handle calls for service. Additionally, to improve our uh, visibility and presence at the schools um, during those times where our SROs are unavailable either due to training they have to attend or va personal vacations or the like, uh, we're going to we anticipate training two officers as backup SROs to fill those gaps. Um, so there aren't any vacancies in coverage at the schools. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to increase school visits, not just with the SROs, but with the other uh, officers on duty, so they can become more familiar with the layout of the school, with the staff, with the faculty, and with the students. Thank you very much, Chief. You Appreciate are. your time coming here tonight. Um, thank you so much. Of course. Of course. Tony, address it through me. Yeah, yeah that's okay. I was just wondering if um, motion detectors are also in included in any of this in terms of like associated overnight overnight surveillance you know someone piggyback on a on an event like this where you know, and then we get somewhere but you'll yeah we have them yeah okay yeah i get texts and calls all night <laughs> no but you're right question. good question yeah. thank you yep. is um does anybody have any questions for alicia before we move on from that all right thank you felicia sure. thank you Mayor, you're up um, establishment of the final day of school and ask the committee if they would approve Wednesday, June 14th, which is a half day for students as our last day of school for this school year. Yes, please. I'll make a motion. Thank you, no snow. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then uh, the school calendar for next year. This calendar that you have includes attending school on Good Friday. Okay. Um, if I may, out, in case anybody's unaware, the school attendance, uh, having school on Good Friday was obviously a topic of discussion um, recently. So in the last month, five weeks, I received a few email, about four to five emails regarding this topic. Um, two or three of them were indifferent. A couple of them said so, indifferent and okay having school that day. Some things that were mentioned where the reason they were upset about it is because it was never discussed. Um, I think that was sufficiently disputed about the fact that it was never discussed, so I'm not gonna go there again. Um, we had decent attendance. We had really good, we had better than I thought attendance for teachers um, throughout that day. Um, the students, the younger they were, the more they were in school. Um, so I don't know if the younger students are more religious than the older students or, um, but at the same time, I think we don't, we don't, we do have school on the Jewish holidays. I, this wasn't something I thought I was gonna be okay. I didn't think it was gonna be something that was gonna work. Um, I think it does and I think it will. So I'm okay with this calendar as is. If anybody else wants to have any discussion on it, we can feel free to, but I just, um, with the amount of, chatter that was out there 
four weeks ago, I needed to make that statement. So. Um, I just want to say, I think that one of the things that really missed is that I think Danielle, you brought it up, uh, which I think it's a good idea, but because um, at the end of the school year, Juneteenth was added, um, and if we were to have five days, then that would like lead us into having one more additional school day, you know, on a Tuesday, let's say. Um, so, I think that's one of the reasons that I was brought up. I mean, I was brought up in a district that we had all the Jewish holidays off, mm -hmm. um, and we just went to school longer, basically. So, wow. um, I'm not super religious. It doesn't affect me. I didn't hear a lot, or I don't think anybody up here as well, I didn't hear a lot of bad chatter. Um, I just heard like a lot of the high school kids, I think just wanted to kind of get away with the day if they could. Um, and because there were no repercussions, basically, if you missed uh, a sport. Their parents had to sign off on that. Yeah. And, you know, right. And it's important to know. So the reason Juneteenth was added is Juneteenth became a federal holiday. Right, exactly. Um, and so. then um, this, is, this is just a state holiday. Well, it's a religious. Yeah, religious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. The only question I do have, yeah, the only question I do have on the calendar, Peter, is, and I guess if we have it, we have it, but is the Veterans Day observed on November 10th? Is that a real thing? It's always on yeah. Tuesday. No, it's always the 11th. Oh, the 11th. But I just, with the 11th being a Saturday, so I know my job, I don't have the 10th as a holiday. I guess that's why I'm asking. So if we establish it, we establish it. Or if it's a, we can look back on it, I don't know. But. Yeah, it's been, um, my memory is that when Veterans Day falls on a weekend, there's an observance that takes place during the week. Okay. That's fine. I mean, that, that, that's what we established anyway. That works for me. So is there any further discussion on the calendar? I'll be looking for a motion to approve the calendar as presented, um, which just so people know, if we don't have snow next year, the last day of school is June 11th. Um, so um, I'll be looking for a motion to approve the calendar as presented. May I make a motion? A we'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, new business establishment of the next school committee meeting, uh, Tuesday, May 23rd, 7 p.m. here in the library. Um, I know it's late, but we have one informational item and I want to read it. Um, it was a letter from the superintendent to the Vume Boosters to Melissa Merrick, their president. Um, on behalf of the students and families of the Avenue Public Schools, thank you for your thoughtful, kind, and supportive work for our student athletes. Your dedicated and creative collaboration with us has always provided benefits to our students that we could never achieve without you. Most recently, you gen generously provided Abington High School varsity letterman jackets to the members of our unified sports team. This gesture was a special moment for the individual students, the unified program, and the Abington Public Schools. Beyond that significant moment, we will continue to feel a heartfelt benefit. These jackets will be worn by the receiving students for many years to come with the purest green wave pride. So thank you to the Boosters and Los Americ for providing most of the unified athletes at their basketball game in March, I think it was. Um, some dates to remember. Uh, Saturday, April 29th, Abington Town Elections at Beaverbrook Elementary School from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, I'm going to go off script a little bit on the next one. Um, Melissa actually told me that their meeting is not going to be on May 4th. She doesn't have the date yet. So we can scratch that. I did want to add that I saw an email come through today. Wednesday, May 3rd, the LPAC will have their meeting at 7 p.m. in the seminar room downstairs in the high school. Um, and, a and I got this email this morning. AEF is having their meeting on Wednesday, May 10th. Um, do you know, do you know where, I think, is it Town Hall? Um, yeah, we need one, of the bottom one of the rooms in town hall when you first walk in. And also they have an ongoing uh, keychain fundraiser with uh, Rustic, I think it's Rustic Molly. Yeah. Um, the details are on their Facebook page or aefgreenwave.org is their website. Um, before we adjourn, I did want to acknowledge that tonight is Wendy Happel's last night um, serving, as a member of the school, serving as a member of the school committee during a meeting. Um, Wendy's been on the school committee for eight years. She's been re-elected three times since then, in 2016, 2017, and 2020, in the middle of a pandemic with me. Um, so, Wendy, thank you for your time. Thank you for volunteering. Um, I appreciate all you've given to the committee. 
Um, Peter, I don't know, do you want to, why don't you add something to it? <laughs> yeah, um, when he, you and I have had some, you know it, some knockdown drag em out battles over the years. Um, but you've also been a school committee member during some of the most challenging times, certainly in, in the most challenging times in my career. And you've always listened. You've always, um, we've disagreed at times. And uh, no matter which side of an issue, I, and I, I've always believed that your, you know, your heart was, was in the right place. Doesn't mean we agree, but your heart was in the right place. And so um, with being a school member, you get, you get zero pay. Nobody up here gets any money. And they give up their time and their energy and their emotion, and it's tough. And I'm just, I'm uh, fortunate to be able to work with everybody, and I you know, appreciate your service to the kids in Abington. Sure. Thank you very much. I just want to thank everybody as well. I want to thank um, my family, uh, my husband and my daughter, um, for their commitment along with me, um, all that have supported me. I definitely want to thank you, Peter, um, for always being there to allow me to vent and um, carry me out. And like you said, we haven't always been on the same side. But I definitely know I changed your mind at times. Um, and you can change mine as well. Um, and I know it hasn't been easy, <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say throughout all of this, you have been an awesome superintendent, and there is no doubt on how I've ever felt about the way that you lead your team and this school system and um, the love that you have for our students here in this town, and I appreciate that very, very much. Um, and. You can officially retire from me texting you constantly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Felicia, I just want to thank you. Um, I know that you're going to do so awesome as our next superintendent. Um, and basically, you know, I would, my daughter's in 11th grade. It wouldn't be wise, I don't think. Um, as you get older, you kind of you don't really have, um, you know, when your kids are smaller, it, I think that's when you kind of have to be on school today. Um, and as you get older, you kind of, you know, things don't affect your kids as much, you know, or the kids around them. So um, I definitely think that this is suitable for um, people with, you know, elementary um, school kids, middle school kids. I definitely encourage everybody to get involved um, and let your voices be heard. So just also want to thank um, all the school committee members I've ever worked with, and especially want to thank uh, the students of Abington. I have never been more proud. Every time I walk into, you know, walk on a field or in um, on a court or at a musical or an art exhibit or just seeing you guys, you know, at all the events um, filming. I've been so proud of you. I feel like you're like my own kids, you know, just looking up and seeing kids like from when they were little to growing up and moving on out. So thank you for all you do. And um, you know, just keep spreading green a little bit everywhere you go. So thank you with any Thank you, Wendy. Enjoy your free time. Enjoy your two last Tuesdays of the month. You might have a little bit of coming here. Um, so with that, I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn from you. Oh, I would probably make that motion. A second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all very much and always a long night.